What is it about your favorite celebrities that makes them so special to you? Hello there, this is Bradley, and you're listening to the first episode of a brand new season of Psych Everywhere, a podcast by Psychi, the International Honor Society in Psychology. For this show, distinguished guests weigh in on applying psychology findings to a diverse range of contemporary issues and bettering your life. For today's episode, I have the privilege of introducing our new 2021-22 Psychi president, Dr. Nock Bowie from the University of Laverne in California. There, she is a fully tenured professor and serving as Interim Associate Dean for Effectiveness Planning and Faculty Affairs in the College of Arts and Sciences. So in 2017, Dr. Bowie published a journal article. It's called Exploring Similarity Characteristics, Identification, and Parasocial Interactions in Choice of Celebrities. So now I know what you're thinking, parasocial interactions. You're thinking ghosts, right? I honestly was thinking ghosts, but this is even cooler. (laughs) So this article was published in the journal Psychology of Popular Media Culture. And so what are parasocial interactions? They're people's perceived intimate relationships with their favorite performers, right? Their favorite celebrities. And the article compares that to celebrity identification. Now, that is when fans kind of want to actually model or emulate or basically become the celebrity. So I'll say that one more time just to make sure it's clear. Parasocial interactions is about perceived relationship with the celebrity. Celebrity identification is wanting to identify as the celebrity. So when Dr. Bowie has also published a couple of other articles a few years before that on the topic of people's attitudes on celebrity. So this wasn't new to her. Um, Near the end of this episode, we're also going to introduce Dr. Bowie's brand new Connect with Psychi presidential theme, which is going to be the theme for this season of the entire podcast. Are you excited to find out about some upcoming episodes for the season? I know I am, but first, let's hear what Dr. Bowie has to say about celebrity relationships. Dr. Bowie, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So I think. My favorite celebrity, at least these days, is Alan Alda, right? Because he's a non-scientist. He's often interviewing scientists. I can certainly relate to that. And he's just charming. And there's MASH. (laughs) Could you, for kind of a fun first question, could you share any of your favorite celebrities and sort of why you like them so much? Well, um, the first celebrity I think I kind of followed, although we didn't Mm -hmm. have social media back in the day, was uh, Michael J. Fox because I watched him on Family Ties and that was around the time his popularity peaked when he was in the Back to the Future movies and a bunch of other movies. And um, why I think uh, I was a fan was, I mean, just based on my behavior was that every time he appeared in Teen Beat magazine or Bop magazine, because back in the day, that's what we did. We would take magazine posters out and put them on our walls. So that's what I did. Um, And I just thought, he was, you know, cute and like he was on all the magazines and the movies were great. And I don't know. I just think something about him made me like be a fan. Um, I over the years haven't followed anybody to that extent, like cut out their pictures and put them on my walls. Um, but I, I just remember specifically my sister making fun of me for like liking Michael J. Fox because she was a big fan of Michael Jackson and had a big poster of his Pretty Young Thing album up on her wall. <laughs> so, yeah. I remember when Steve Irwin died and I was in high school And I just remember being really surprised by how much that kind of devastated me. And I think it's the first time that I realized just how important our favorite celebrities really are to us. What do you think is the importance or value of these relationships we have with celebrities? Can we even call that relationship real? I think they're real. And what you just, what you defined um, for your audience is um, perfect. What, when you said parasocial interactions are kind of the intimate relationships we, we have with these celebrities and uh, it's, it's shows that 
these celebrities, these characters that we see on television or movies or read about, even in, in fiction, and if we have a connection with them, it shows that we are empathetic, social human beings that like to connect with others, even if these others are not real people. I was interested in in looking at this because I know people have told me things like what you just said about Steve Irwin dying and it affecting you um, when favorite celebrities or even characters in a show. I mean, the celebrity didn't die, but the character was killed mm-hmm. off or something. People are very upset. People get um, really attached to what they um, have developed over the time that they spent with this character or the celebrity following them or reading about them or watching them. And so I, I think it's a real thing. And I think it's it's not unusual that you develop that sense of connection because we are the type of being that wants connection. So we want, even if it's for something like this, for media figures like this, not not someone we actually know, but somebody we think we know, um, we feel invested, we follow them for a while, and so it becomes to us a real relationship. And, and people do get upset, and people get happy when they see their favorite celebrity sometimes have joy in their lives. They have a baby, they, they are in a relationship, they get married, they have a new, you know, something great going on. People also feel um, joy as well. So it, it's, it's a real thing. I don't doubt that. So how did you become interested in researching celebrities? I wanted a research topic um, back around this time. I started in like 2012, thinking of a new uh, arena for my social psychological um, uh, field of research. So my area is social psych. And I don't have a particular focus, although I lean toward looking at attitudes and perception. And when I was thinking of um, something that no one had really explored before, I was thinking of this same question you had about when people see someone like Steve Irwin die and they're really affected by it. Why is that? And can social psychology explain that? And so uh, when I started studying this, I was looking into um, people who were just mega fans, these the, what we call stands now, these stalking fans that go around and and really um, follow their celebrities uh, in every aspect, whether it's like join a fan club, um, join them online, buy their merchandise, you know, read every book they've written or whatever. And so I, I went into this um, area and, it, and I haven't revisited it yet since, but I had a series, like you mentioned, of several articles about um, just celebrities. And I thought it was easy to conduct a research project like this. Because if you ask anybody, they have somebody who's a favorite celebrity of theirs. I mean, everybody does. And it's not always who you expect, because sometimes I would uh, assume it was a a movie star or something like that. Um, There was a part of my research where I asked them, do you have a favorite celebrity? Who is it? Write their name here. And people would put down names from poets, uh, politicians, um, rap artists, even international stars that we, you know, in America, we don't know about. Um, all kinds of people. So I thought it was an easy thing to do. Students were interested in it because I had a large response of uh, participants and students who were who just were wanting to know more about it when I talked about it in class and I was use it as examples for my research methods class or my you know um, different statistics class that I was teaching. So that's why I got interested in it. Um, not a, not for any particular reason, but just that what led me there was my social psychological interest and an area that really hadn't been looked in it in this way. Are there any factors that sort of predict who our favorite celebrities might be? I think some of the findings, and again, it's preliminary. There's been other probably follow-up studies to this, but what I found was that um, what we see in our environment um, does impact who we choose as a favorite celebrity. So I think back to when you asked me beginning about who my favorite celebrity back when I was, you know, a teenager, um, why Michael J. Fox? He's he's a white Canadian actor. Um, why not somebody else? Like um, now we see more diverse celebrities of all sorts. Um, why not a woman? Why didn't I choose somebody who I was following that was a female actress? Um, I didn't see that on Teen Beat Magazine. I didn't see that a lot on Bop Magazine, which is what we had, we didn't have, you know, internet and social media back then. So I think it is driven by what we see. It is driven by um, maybe some personal characteristics. So I, I thought gender would predict 
women choosing more female um, media celebrities and males choosing more males. But my research showed that most people choose males overall. Males choose more males. Females choose a little bit more female celebrities as their favorite, but they still also chose males. So male Mm -hmm. actors, singers, celebrities were more often chosen. So I don't think that's a strong, robust like difference. Um, you would also think uh, maybe it's a if they're older, if the person's a little older, they would choose an older person, and that that didn't pan out as well. Only very small differences um, in in age related factors and ethnicity. Overwhelmingly, most of the celebrities um, they chose were white, and again, I think that's just what we see around us, and it reminds me of. Um, you know, recently we had uh, the Emmy Awards and there was a criticism about the Emmys being Emmy so white. So hashtag Emmy so white. And they talked about how the top four acting prizes went to all white actors. And uh, the Oscars already had a hashtag Oscar so white. And they were being very <laughs> deliberate about including more people in different categories, directing, acting, writing, producing, whatever. And Emmys, they still said weren't moving along as fast as some other groups that are seeing that they're not being as inclusive. So I think it is what we see around us um, that impact who we choose. It may not be so much our own characteristics. Are there some people who are more likely to want to have a relationship with the celebrity, like a parasocial interaction? And then are there other people who are more likely that they want to become the celebrity? Um. Some of the research, and not not my research, but some of the research I've I've read about, um, indicated that uh, with identification, the people that really want to be like another person, another their favorite celebrity, um, maybe they want to change their body, their face, their just their mannerisms, everything to become this this person. Um, there may be some psychological um, tendencies that that predict that. Um, like some body dysmorphia, some some other problems that they may have in their life that make them want to become someone else. Um, as opposed to parasocial uh, interactions, I think everybody develops parasocial interactions. I think that's normal. I don't think it's like, well, only the lonely people want to then connect with their favorite you know, TV star. I don't think that's true. You would assume that to be true um, because you, would, you don't think people get that involved or attracted or um, emotionally connected to somebody they don't even know, but actually there's quite a few people across a range of, of, like, you know, spectrums all around the world that connect to somebody they like, uh, whether it's, a, and, and a lot of times people don't, um, necessarily think of, uh, actors. They, they, their first kind of celebrity exposure is an athlete. So there, there have been articles that talk about like baseball athletes and soccer athletes, because soccer is a very universal sport. So around the world, there are big soccer stars that people um, have a connection to. It's not like they want to be that person, but they follow them. They get really upset when they get traded or they get hurt or something happens. And so uh, I remember when Magic Johnson announced he had HIV and had to retire from the Lakers, my dad broke down in tears. Like literally he was upset. Um, he was very upset and he, he loved the Lakers. He still to this day loves the Lakers, but that really affected a lot of people like it, it, because they have that connection, they follow them. They, they really, uh, empathize with what he was going through. So that's a normal, I think, relationship people have with their favorite media figures. Like it's not like a certain lonely, crazy person that does this. It's, it's a lot of people have that experience. Do you think who a person's chosen celebrity is says anything about that person? Um, I I don't think so um, personally. Like that's why when I if I chose a, a favorite person, it's not because they reflect me or it says something about my choices in in particular. But I think people are more aware uh, now of who they choose to be a a favorite media person or follow, because I think now it may be entwined with a political statement or some kind of statement about um, their identity more so than just, I like them. You know, it's, it's a statement of some sort nowadays. And I think that's due to 
um, people being more aware of identities in general and making voices heard that weren't heard before. So they're 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 purposely intentionally following or supporting celebrities that maybe back in the day wouldn't have been heard or even seen. So I think now maybe it's more of, you know, I'm choosing to really be a follower of this person or buy or watch their movies or read their books because I want to make a statement or support that as opposed to back in the day, we didn't even, we didn't think about it that way. We just say, oh, well, they look cute or they're pretty or they have a nice voice. We're going to follow them or, you know, be a fan. Um, so I, I think maybe it does today, but I personally didn't choose celebrities because it said something about me or I don't think it reflected anything about myself. If we have a celebrity, are, are we sort of blindly loyal to them? And maybe we might even disregard a criticism about them or a scandal that we hear about or something like that. Are we vulnerable to that? Um, I think we are because uh, mm -hmm. I, I did a study called um, belief perseverance and um, celebrity attitude. So belief perseverance is, where you stick to a belief and even if there's uh, other information, negative information, contradictory information, you just keep sticking to your belief um, re regardless of that. So what I found was um, even if you make people think of the opposite, we call it the um, consider the opposite strategy. So in my, in my study, I asked people, who's your favorite celebrity? And they wrote it down. And then I, I just said, can you think of, reasons why other people wouldn't like your favorite celebrity. And then they would choose either, no, I can't think of any reason, or I can think of one reason maybe, um, or I can think of two or more reasons and three or more reasons. So what I found was um, even the people who could think of other reasons why people, other people didn't like their favorite celebrity, I posed a scenario that what if your favorite celebrity was caught doing something bad? Um, would you still like them? So first you make them think of something called the opposite, which is not liking their celebrity. And then you pose this scenario where what if your favorite mm -hmm. celebrity was, was doing something terrible? What would you think now? They still liked their celebrity. <laughs> they still, they still would say, so what? Like, okay, I still like them. And then I pose some questions like, well, what if the information came from your family who said, Hey, I, I heard this, your favorite celebrity, like did something bad, or it came from friends or it came from the media, like a newspaper or you saw a video of the celebrity doing the bad act, now what would you think? So I gave these four different sources of information. And the sources, um, when it came from family or friends, they the person, even though they thought the opposite strategy, even though these sources are telling them, hey, I, you know, I heard your celebrities you know, doing bad things, they still like didn't change their belief about their celebrity. They still love their celebrity. And my explanation for that is. Belief perseverance, so social psychology can explain people like to hold on to the ideas they originally have. Secondly, they might have thought that the family or friends telling them this information are haters. You know, you, oh, you're just a hater. You just don't like my celebrity. I'm the only one that likes them. So you would say anything, you know, negative. And um, I think it's it's a really powerful um, thing. Even thinking the opposite strategy didn't work to change their minds. They've held on to this notion that it's their favorite person and they're not going to let it go. Um, mm -hmm. Now I would say that I only did one study. I didn't do a follow-up. I didn't see, I didn't find out if, what if I specifically described a bad act? Like I left the bad act open. So we don't know exactly what would change someone's mind. Like what if their favorite celebrity, when I say they did something bad, maybe it's benign to, to them what bad is. Maybe they stole something or didn't pay when they left a restaurant. Maybe the bad act was being like a, a killer, a rapist, you know, molester. That's different mm. than just not paying a restaurant bill. I didn't specify. So maybe if we go back and redo the study and specify, maybe that would change people's belief perseverance to about their celebrity. I also asked them who their favorite celebrity was, but I didn't ask them if they were a casual fan or like a mega fan stan kind of follower, because you could now ask things like, are you part of their fan club? Do you, how are you a follower on Twitter of, you know, their, their social media stuff? Um, how often do you see their movies or listen to their music? I didn't ask more details about the casualness or, you know, seriousness of their fan fandom. 
And it makes me think that um, we could break belief perseverance because you ask, you know, maybe you hear all these stuff and you're so blindly loyal, you know, even though other people think you're crazy, like, why are you still following this person? They did something terrible. I think you could um, have people change their minds about their favorite celebrity. Fans can change their minds um, if those factors were revealed, as I mentioned, like what type of crime it was that they committed. Um, and how big of a fan you are to be following them. So I think of, um, do you remember that TV show Glee? Yeah. Um, I used to watch that. And when my kids were little, I'm, I know they didn't follow a lot of the storyline because it was a little bit, you know, more risque, but the songs they like, they like seeing the, you know, the singing. And then it went to Netflix. And now I can't even watch it on Netflix. I can't. It's because um, there was one actor, one of the main actors, he died of a drug overdose. Another actor um, died by suicide after pleading guilty to child pornography. I mean, it started, and then what the the main female actor, um, she was bashed on social media for being insensitive and being a diva and all this. And now it makes me not want to watch the show, even though I was a huge fan back in the day. And I think it, you can change the blind loyalty to some degree because of some of those factors that I mentioned, it can, it can change it. Okay. Well, I have one last question for this section. So now that we've really established the power of parasocial relationships, I always like to ask, well, what can we do about it? What, how do we use this information? I think um, we can use this information to understand phenomena that people used to think was like, so out there, so, you know, uh, crazy and weird, which is back in the day, people thought it was very weird that all these fans fainted at the sight of the Beatles singing, right? They went to a Beatles concert and people were falling all over themselves, passing out, screaming, crying. And there were news reports like, what is wrong with all these people, you know? And then you still see it today with um, big concerts of people who like BTS is huge, the BTS army of fans or like anything that is against them, they totally shut you down on social media if you, if you cross uh, the BTS in any way. So they are mega loyal fans. And I think what we didn't realize is how powerful this fan celebrity relationship actually is. So it, it helps us understand that a little bit better. I think it also helps us understand um, why, and I'm aside from actors or singers, why people follow uh, politicians. So the previous president of ours has a huge fan following and people are blindly loyal to this previous president of ours in the same way we describe those um, PSI relationships for actors and singers and, uh, and other media. And it makes us wonder, well, how is it that these cult-like followings continue? Well, we just, we now understand it's belief perseverance it's a PSI relationship they're building with this person. They feel some connection with them and it becomes something you, it's very hard to break. It's not impossible, but it's very hard to break. Um, so we understand that better, um, I think, uh, to explain some of that. And if we're looking for trying to figure out, um, I guess, where this all came from, it didn't come from like modern you know, media. It didn't come because we invented the television and radio. People probably were, and I can't verify this, but I'm, I'm assuming people probably were mega fans um, and had PSI relationships with religious figures, with um, their, you know, politicians, government officials, heads of, you know, their villages, because even though we don't know, because we can't measure it, we weren't there to measure it. We know this probably is a normal human way to to relate to somebody who they put up on a pedestal who they admire and so they, this probably was around for a very long time just people did, couldn't figure out what to call it or what, what it was but now we know and it's it's helping us to probably further research what we can do about this blind loyalty or even in the face of these negative um information what, what do we do to help fans realize you know this, per, this is not a good person um so i, I think that's what what we'll use this information for Okay. Well, let's move on to the second part of the episode. So if you know Dr. Bowie, she's a social psychologist, and she's just fascinated by individual and all sorts of group relationships like this. 
Um, so it's only natural that her presidential theme for Sci-Kai this year is connect with Sci-Kai, which is going to involve launching new networking programs and mentorship opportunities, increased exposure of research on improving group interactions and relationships, and even more. So while I've got her here, I thought this is going to be a really fun opportunity to sort of ask her some questions about her theme and see what we can expect moving forward. So my first question is this, could you tell us about any of the programs that you'd like to roll out in support of the theme? Sure. Um, I would like to develop an internship connection or database of some sort. Mm -hmm. My vision is to have a database that can allow um, our members to access potential internships across the country. And um, that would help connect them to the field Um, And I'm not just talking about clinical psychology. There's lots of internships that are outside of clinical um, research and teaching and um, community uh, based internships that um, maybe students didn't realize were out there. And actually, some of them can be done virtually. Um, So at our university, when we all went remote, there was we have an internship requirement for our students. Uh, It's part of the requirement to graduate. They have to conduct complete a one semester internship. And when we were at remote, the whole country shut down pretty much. Um, I was wondering how do these students complete their internship when they're sitting at home? Um, Internships imply you go out to the community, you go out to a school. Some of them used to do um, police department ride-alongs. They did research labs. They did things with people out there to get experience and uh, volunteer hours but they were still able to do it. Um, There were just a handful, but there were some virtual internships that they completed uh, where they were peer mentors online. Um, They did uh, some tutoring online. They did different things that they could do on Zoom that we I'd never even thought of before, but I would like to have some kind of easier way than for students to just cold call people or try to find um, things on the internet themselves that we could provide a Sci-Kai to all our members around the the nation. I know a lot of students go through their experience and they maybe never found a mentor or they overlooked networking experiences that they shouldn't have. What do you think is the value of seeking mentors and professional networks? One other program I would like to roll out in connection to um, internship a type of internship database is what you're asking about right now, which is a mentorship um, type kind of directory, Uh, a listing of people who are willing to serve as mentors to help mentees, potential students connect with them. Um, So to your question, um, what, what do you seek out as a mentor or what, what is the value of having a mentor? Is that, do I have that right? Um, Why that is part of, One of the things I would like to roll out um, in my presidential year is when I was a student, I didn't have a specific mentor uh, to give me advice, to help me navigate college. I kind of stumbled around and just luckily didn't screw myself up too terribly to to get um, into college, to successfully get through college, and then to get to graduate school. Um, None of that really was through a mentor. And I thought, you know, maybe this is what people do. You just kind of like screw up and figure it out kind of thing. But I have, and I have colleagues who are older. They're not, they're not the more, they're not the newer colleagues, but the more seasoned ones live by the adage that um, back in the old days, they had to suffer. So then the new people should suffer as well. And I don't think that's, that's necessary. I think it's a big waste of time. I think people who have the experience and can give some um, support or direction to people should do that because why would you want people to suffer? And why wouldn't you help them avoid the same problems you had? Why is it that just because you went through trial by fire, they should as well? That's just a weird perspective to me. So I think mentors are helpful to just give some general advice. I think every situation is going to be different. Students are going to have a very new uncharted path that maybe the mentors never even envisioned for back when they were going through school, but at least they could give advice about strategy or their own kind of way of handling problems or issues, things to think about um, that maybe the mentees wouldn't have 
thought about. So I think that's important for somebody to hear some advice. I think it's important not just to have an academic advisor, generally speaking, I think they need a specific mentor in the field. Um, so my, I, my hope is students who are afraid to reach out for mentors, who don't know how to find a good mentor, they see people around, they just don't know how to ask them or what to ask them, that we will develop um, some programs. And we've talked, we had it in Psychi before, but I think a more like targeted, tied into the theme approach may open the eyes of a lot more people um, to, to network and develop these professional kind of relationships. Yeah, I'm really excited to see where this goes. I think this is going to be the perfect focus for us. We've got so many chapters and different people, and particularly with COVID this year, people are isolated, and we have exactly the resources that I think they're going to need and want to be able to connect um, through Psychi. It's going to be really fun. Do you have any favorite um, Psychi networking memories that you'd like to share? I don't have a specific memory because uh-huh. I've been in, I was, when I was an undergrad um, 30 years ago or so, um, I went to a Psychi meeting because somebody had told me about it. And then I just started coming and then I ran for president when the president was graduating and she was like, you should run. So I did. And so I became chapter president there. And then when I got to my university position now, years later after graduate school, somebody in the department meeting turned, looked around the table and said, oh, we need a new psych advisor because the last one left or retired or something. And so, oh, how about this new person? So they pointed at me. <laughs> And I said, sure, I love Psyche. I was a student in Psyche, I'm a member and a president. So what, I, and, and there are different kinds of examples of that where things just happened. And instead of saying no, or instead of saying, I'm not so sure, maybe not, I said, yes. Mm-hmm. And, it, and a lot of those examples about saying yes to things happened to be with Psyche. Um, And you, I guess my favorite memory, I guess, is uh, going to regional conventions and seeing the robust chapters that were there representing Psychi and their university, and just thinking to myself, if I if it wasn't for me serving in this role, when I said yes at that department meeting, I wouldn't even get to see this. Um, so it was saying yes to a lot of things. Um, even uh, being Western Regional Vice President years ago, um, I just said yes to that because somebody had asked if I was cons- if I would consider doing that. And then this position right now as president, it, ha- it they had asked me before. I wasn't in the position to say yes back then. My children were little. Now they're all grown and pretty much independent. When they asked me again, I said yes. So I think a lot of networking may may be just to open doors. the The key to the success of that may be to say yes to certain things. Um, even though you're afraid, even though you, I had no idea what being president would mean, um, but you say yes and you you learn along the way and it opens a lot of opportunities for, for other things. So I don't have one specific memory, but those all those memories connect back to Psychi for some reason. So that's that that's my like spiel for connecting with Psychi is it helped me connect with everything. I love that. And just like every Psychi president, when she first became involved in the society, I'm sure Nock never in a million years would have guessed that one day she would be the president of Psychi. And you know, that's the way it is every single year with a new president. They never knew. But the way they got there was just by getting involved, trying things like she's done and it's led there. We have so many research experience opportunities, leadership opportunities, funding for your research, funding for your education, your school, educational content. And so this year, the focus is going to be on getting you to connect with Psychi and try these things. Give us a shot. I think you're going to be really amazed. I remember, I think my favorite Psychi memory is I went to a convention and I had never done that before. I'd always worked with Psychi kind of behind the computer away from the students. And so for the first time, I got to hand out flyers for the journal, for Psychi Journal. And I would walk around and look at the students' posters and tell them, this looks really fascinating. We'd love to receive an article like this. 
and they got so excited. And and I've worked with the journal for years, so I knew like all the educational the information they were going to learn about the peer review process and the extra time we were going to take for them. And I knew that like this was if they took this step, if I could just get them to do that, I knew that this was really going to be a pivotal moment, I think, for their research. And that was just really exciting to me. So I really encourage you all get involved to show you can certainly get involved in your local chapters and start trying out some leadership roles. We have an officer position for pretty much everything you can think of. And if you don't see an officer position that's quite right for your goals, make up a new officer position. If you want to talk about a certain topic or run events like of that sort, go for it. And I really do believe that you're going to appreciate what you did later down the line. And who knows, maybe you'll become president. So, um, yeah, I agree with all what you said. It's <laughs> it's amazing what people will will discover. So I hope they do connect with us. Season four on the podcast is going to honor Connect with Psychi theme in many ways. Coming up soon, we're going to reveal specific ways that you can network with students, faculty, and professionals at those big professional events like conventions. For another episode, we're going to talk about what are healthy ways to network on social media. And we might even talk about what's going to happen to our brains if we are on social media too much and what would happen to our behavior if we just ditched it all together. Um, Speaking of communicating, does teaching and texting mix? That should be a fun topic for sure that we've already got lined up coming soon for both learners and educators. We're also going to share tips to help you establish meaningful mentorships for professional growth and advancing your career. And last but not least, you know, this podcast started with episodes on diversity and we're going to continue that trend. We're going to talk about the value of diverse relationships. So to learn more about this year's theme, I want you to go check out Dr. Bowie's new magazine article. It's called Connect with Psychi, and I'm going to put a link in the show notes so you can access that. We'll keep you up to date on Connect with Psychi here on the podcast too. And you can, of course, follow Psychi on social media for the latest details. Check out hashtag Connect with Psychi and don't be afraid to use it. Let us know that you're a Psychi member and what your topics are that you're interested in on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or really wherever you go. You've just listened to another episode of Psych Everywhere. If you haven't already subscribed to the show, go ahead and follow us wherever you listen to podcasts. Tell a friend or a colleague about Psych Everywhere. Word of mouth for podcast is a huge help. So share what you learned at the dinner table or in your classes. You can also follow us on Twitter at Psychi Podcast and leave a review at Apple Podcast or wherever you go for podcast. You'll absolutely, I promise, make my day. And more importantly, you'll be helping us to get psych everywhere. Okay, everyone, that's all for now. I'll connect with you again soon. Copyright 2022. Psychi, the International Honor Society in Psychology. All rights reserved.